like to come after Randy because I'm so much better looking and more intriguing than he is. Um, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about promotion point. Uh, I'm not going to give you a history. Randy did a good job there. I am going to expand on that a little bit. But um, from a promotion standpoint, it really is talking about, we heard Randy talk about vibrancy. This is bringing life you know, and, and kind of showing that people can exist in your district. Um, and that's one of the big things that promotion focuses in on. Um, they always have these long drawn out definitions of what it is. Um, simplify this down, the promotion point and the focus on promotion is focused on having three different areas of, of activities. One is called image development. One is called special events, and one is called retail and business activities. What do those mean? So image activities. This is really about changing people's perception of downtown. And one of the interesting things is that doesn't always mean that there is a preconceived negative. It is just as important to simply acknowledge that downtown is ever-changing. We talked about this a little yesterday with this idea that locals, we always hear people complain about the students. Because, you know, students are here for four years, so they're turning over. And they're like, well, students don't ever shop down. They, they do. They do. But the fact is, if you talk to a downtown business owner, there's probably not a week that goes by that somebody from the community doesn't come in and say, oh, my gosh, this is so great. How long have you been open? 12 years. You know, the motivation to explore your own community is virtually not a People know what they know, they go where they go, and they don't think to break their own patterns. So one of the best things we can do is kind of change those patterns up. Now, I want to share a couple of examples. This really is about building pride. It's about creating that connection. Typically, when you go into a community, one of the only ways that you can connect and show pride with that community is typically through high school sportswear. You know, it is very, very difficult in most places to get any kind of merchandise. So being able to create a brand that you can truly share with the business community where they can profit off of that connection. Uh, these are some from a neighborhood in Baltimore called Waverly. Um, we even went so far as to one of the cool things in this neighborhood is they had a ton of takeout restaurants. And then they had this one vacant former bus station and um, we came up with this idea of creating a kind of shared dining room. And it was called Bring Your Own Food. And, you know, they did branded placemats where it's like, this is just where you hang out and you can eat your, your takeout food. Um, you know, everything from one of the great things about communities is we are really, really good at designing the ugliest shirts possible. Um, I call them car wash shirts. You know, they're the ones that have 7,000 logos on the back and you only wear them to cut the grass or paint in. So, like, being able to actually create apparel that people want to wear is really important. Creating things that help to tell the story, shopping and dining guides, sharing and telling the story of what you have to offer. Um, Randy talked a little bit about this. Being able to take your brand and make its way out into available property. When you see a giant for sale or for rent sign, all that says is this is dying. This is empty, this is dead, but it doesn't say the other side of that. It doesn't talk about the fact that this poses an opportunity. Um, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, and we had this amazing space that really helped to transform our downtown, but it was subterranean. Like you had to walk down the stairs into this space, and it's been, it's called Coffee Underground. It's been this great uh, coffee shop for 20 some odd years, but when it was vacant, I'll never forget the sign. It said, what would you put down here? And it was like bakery, restaurant, and then it just said, cheers bar? Question mark. Because you'd walk down the stairs like you would at cheers. So, you know, being able to take those opportunities and connect those dots. Um, every community, and we gave you some props yesterday, we didn't hear a whole lot of complaints about parking, but we just feel like maybe our group size wasn't large enough. Um, <laughs> One of the things that's interesting is 100% of the communities that we work in have a parking problem. The parking problem that they have is that their consumers are lazy. Um, what we want to have exist in our downtown is a destination mindset. When a consumer is motivated to explore a district, 
they are no longer complaining about the parking. And one of the funny things is, the people that you hear the complaints from are the merchants. And I always ask the question, it's like, well, how are you hearing these complaints? And they're like, well, the customer's telling us when they come in the store. Great, so the system worked. They made their way into the store. They parked, they got out, and they walked. They just didn't like it. You know, that's different. They, that's, that's one of those things that you want to evolve. But one of the big things that we started to learn is that means that the downtown business owner is our first line of defense against the parking complaints. Mm -hmm. The problem is most cities automatically jump to the fact that we hear parking complaints, which means we need more parking. We have two solutions, buy a historic building and level it, or build a parking garage at an average of $22,000 per space. Those are pretty expensive and dramatic solutions to somebody being lazy. So what we've done is for a mere $100, you can design, print, and distribute a business card size parking map that highlights all the different parking capabilities. So now all of a sudden, what you have done is you have armed the business owner with a response to the complaint. Because if they have no response, then all they're left to do is commiserate. But now you've made it easy to say, sorry you didn't find the space, here are all of our parking end of conversation. It's been amazing how much little gestures like this have, have changed things. Um, we work in State College, Pennsylvania, also a college town, um, similar in dynamic, I would imagine, except for slightly more students, I guess, at, at Penn State. Um, they had an issue where nobody was parking in their parking garage. And they wanted to send people to the garage. Well, how do we tell people about the garage, they started to adopt a courtesy parking ticket. So on the first offense, instead of simply giving somebody a ticket, they would give them this overtime tag that would tell them about, hey, it appears as though you really enjoy our downtown because you stayed longer than you paid for. <laughs> Next time, stay all day and park in one of our garages. And then they followed that up with a series of ads, and I loved it. Uh, Chayden yesterday was able to rattle off the exact number of of spaces in the downtown. You know, the very same thing. There's nowhere to park downtown except for our 2037 parking. <laughs> you know, so um, so it was kind of easy. We launched this whole campaign. Originally, it was called Park Easy. If you know anything about Penn State, they're located in Happy Valley. So they actually changed the brand to Park Happy. And it really became this whole mantra of we want to make your interaction with our parking very positive. Another thing that State College did was they adopted Park Mobile as a digital payment platform for their parking management. They were convinced that their overall parking revenues were going to go down if they made it easier for people to park legally. They were convinced that if their infractions decreased, their revenue would also decrease. They saw a 35% increase in parking revenues with an infraction decrease. So people were paying. They weren't getting tickets, they weren't having that negative interaction, and revenue was going up. So pretty cool stories as it relates to that. Um, sometimes you have to hit negative perceptions spot on. This is San Pedro, California, and literally we heard over and over again how unsafe it was. Yet as Randy and I walked around, all we saw was people walking the streets, families spending time together. So, you know, sometimes you just take the bull by the horns. No one walks here except for all these people walking here. Um, from there, we move into special events. Special events are, these are our festivals. These are the big events that we do to, to bring people into the community, expose them to the community, um, show them the district. A lot of times these show how many people know how to find it here, know how to be here. Um, if you've ever planned a festival, you know that they're not always fun to pull off. So you want to do these sparingly. But uh, there are a couple great ones I always like to share. Um, Athens, Alabama launched an Athens Greece Festival, a celebration of all things deep fried. And, you know, that's something that people can get behind. It, it always baffles me when somebody will go and do, like, a rutabaga festival. But, like, you know, shrimp, okay, I'll get into that. Seafood festival, yeah, that sounds great. 
um, you know, bourbon festival, I'm on board. So deep fried, yeah, let's dig that. Um, and like to this day, this festival is so great for their Main Street program. It funds the full year of programs. Um, they crown a toga queen every year. They do all kinds of stuff. They do a they do a toga 5K. So everybody <laughs> runs in togas. Um, you know, so just different stuff that that really takes that theme and carries it through. Uh, we heard Randy talk all about art fields. This is a great celebration that turns public art into an event. Um, this is Ellensburg, Washington. They do a thing called Buskers in the Burb, where they celebrate street performers. And uh, they just have all these different street performers throughout. It's, it's almost a Mardi Gras style uh, performance. It's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, but then I wanted to be very deliberate about some events because I think some Main Street programs are mistaken about the purpose of events. Um, Trick-or-treat events are not events that help the retailer. In fact, if you own a business, the idea of hundreds of small costumed children coming in for free candy while their parents wait outside, it is not exposing the parent to the inventory that you have, it is, but it is a gesture of goodwill. I'm not saying the event is bad. I just think a lot of times we misfile it in our mind. It is not beneficial to the business community, but it is a gift to the community as a whole. So make sure that you know the purpose of your event. Same thing with tree lightings and that kind of stuff. Guess what? The holiday season, by nature, is the best season for retail. Make sure when you're doing events, you're doing them for the right reasons and you're doing them for the understood reasons, which is the segue into that final category, the retail and business activities. These are the events to make cash registers ring. These are the strategic events where the Main Street organization becomes a partner of the business community. Now, we overthink these a lot of times. We overcomplicate them and they need to be simple. And the goal of these events is to teach people to shop downtown. Okay? So this is one that I came up with in Fairmont, West Virginia. This is uh, one of the communities that claims to be the birthplace of Mother's Day. And we came up with an event called Saving Mother's Day. And they had 12 downtown merchants that got together the Saturday before Mother's Day. Each one had a different flower. If you went around, you got a free flower. By the end of them, you had a dozen flowers for your, your wife or mother, and you were visiting the stores and, and seeing items that were highlighted. So Saving Mother's Day last-minute Lifesaver Tour was a way for you to take an event that maybe not have, might not have been a great retail event, but it turned into downtown's the place to go when you're last-minute buying gifts. Um, wine walks. For some reason, people love to mix consumption and purchases. So figuring out ways to do that. One of the problems with a lot of these is we love the alliteration of wine walk, but we forget the strategy of we don't want them to just drink. We want them to drink and buy. So making sure that the business is doing their side, I, it never ceases to amaze me. And I will tell you, my wife and I owned a downtown retail business. So I'm not speaking as a person who didn't sit behind the counter and, and watch all the madness happen. But I live in a community of 14,000. We have a St. Patty's Day pub crawl every year. We have an Irish gift shop that is closed no on St. Patty's Day. <laughs> I literally went in and said, you are relevant one day a year. <laughs> and we bring thousands of people here. And you don't open. And, you know, how many times have we heard businesses say, well, that person's not my customer. Well, we're not asking you to marry them. We're asking you to figure out a way to sell something to them that one day. And you can even play in advance. So um, being able to figure out those ways that the events are creating that, whether it's the wine walk, we've all seen the variation with the art walks, uh, any number of things. You guys do some great stuff here with living windows. So living windows by nature is putting an emphasis on the storefront and the sidewalk. Are you doing the things to get them into the store? 
or are you just making it about the sidewalk view? So how do we make those events truly strategic for us? Um, restaurant weeks is a great way to be able to make sure that you're going through whether I'll never forget when I was in um, I was in Austria and there were Austria and Bavaria and it was called Sparkle Wochen, which is Asparagus Week. <laughs> <laughs> and literally restaurants throughout the country had asparagus, you know, and all these different asparagus dishes. So, you know, picking a theme, um, going through and pointing people and actually using the event to motivate the idea of, hey, why don't you take this opportunity to explore one of the restaurants in town that maybe you haven't had before? Um, so that's a pretty easy one to take and run with. <laughs> Extended hours campaign. This is the bane of Main Street's existence. Because <laughs> it happens the same way in every community. Hey, we need to stay open later. If we're only open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., then all of our customers are unemployed. Well, staying open later, that's easier than said than done. Hey, we're going to do an extended hours campaign. We're going to stay open instead of closing at 5, we're going to close at 7. And now all of a sudden, everybody's going to come and shop with us. So we're going to do that one night a month, and three months in, we're going to proclaim that it didn't work, and we're wasting our time, and we're not going to stay open anymore. So... The big thing that we always talk about, and I'll share this, I kind of created a step-by-step -step of how to set these programs up. The first thing that you do is you set appropriate expectations. It will take you three years to change consumer behavior. How do you manage the investment from the business side and the change from the consumer side? Well, you can do one night a month for the first 12 months. It's completely fine. Love alliteration, make it the second Saturday, the first Friday, the third Thursday, I don't care, you know? But what you do is you go through and you start to bring people out purely to reacquaint with the retail and restaurant environment, making that downtown a consideration. Now, the problem that communities have is it might take one year and you start to take traction. It might take two years before it takes traction. Move as the market says to move, expand as the market says to expand, but don't get hung up in being cute. Salisbury, Maryland launched a first Friday event. Took them about three years, and they started getting 4,000 people coming down every Friday. So what did they do? They launched second Saturday. That's not what we should have done. If we can get 4,000 people one Friday, that means that our consumers realize that Fridays can be cool. So the second step should have been, let's start staying open every Friday. Make that your day. So pick what day makes the most sense for your strategic location. How far are people coming from here? Is Thursday the right day? Is, is extended hours on Saturday the right day? But you can't ask a business to try to completely reprogram retail behavior. And, you know, on their own shoulders, and you can't expect it to change in two or three months. Does that make sense? Okay. End of, of preaching there. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is thinking about your events as a strategic schedule throughout the year. This is just a very simple little graphic that I use. We've got our 12 months. The yellow squiggly line is what I forecasted to possibly be your market trends for your community. Everybody's January seems to be like really depressing. And then you kind of have that slow ramp up to kind of a peak out in late spring, early summer. And then here, summer, the students leave and you feel this change in the market and maybe you dip down during the market and then you take this big bump back into September and then it ramps up into your holiday season. That might not be right, but just mapping it out for your own minds. And then what you start to do is you start to graph out all the events that you put on during the year and what category they fall into. So those single dots might be an extended hours campaign once a month. You know, you might be running a certain campaign to, to do this or lead up to a festival to do that. But then you start to think very strategically. 
Do we have a good diversity in our event type? Do our strategic events fall in line with our market trends? If December is the month that is the best for our merchants already, is that the place we need to be doing retail promotions? Or do we need to explore retail promotions in February when they're so depressed that they're ready to quit? You know, having those conversations as an organization is truly, truly important. And when you start to bring these questions to your business community, they're going to feel the fact that you're there trying to support them. Does that make sense? Okay. So then from there, I'm going to introduce something that, that is pretty cool. We've been talking about this for the past couple of years. It's called Main 5. And um, I think in a mainstream world, we like very simple numbers. Um, I always heard Mary Means, who kind of was one of the people that created the four-point approach. She, she said, you know, we were all kind of trapped in a hotel room, and, and we decided that the three-point approach sounded too simple, and the five-point approach was too complicated for people to remember, so four points it was. Um, but one of the things that I always like to remind folks of, and this is where we go back to the history les lesson on Main Street, the goal when they launched this pilot program in 1977, the end action was they wanted to preserve the building. That was, that was the purpose of the program. So they knew they had building owners, they wanted the building owners to make an investment and the outcome to be a preserve the building. So what they came to realize was we can't have building owners making these investments if there's not the presence of a strong economy. How do we create a strong economy that will then create that investor confidence? So they landed on this four-point approach to create that strong economy. Pretty brilliant, really. What they did is they accidentally invented modern economic development. It's a really interesting way to think about it. They understood that you had to create a holistic economy to be able to warrant a private sector investment. Wow, that's pretty forward thinking. You know, go Main Street. So taking that idea and realizing, how do we convey that to folks? Well, nowadays, we convey it in the worst ways possible. The most mundane of mission statements. You know, we've all sat through these processes before mm -hmm. where we go on for months, you know, painstakingly analyzing each and every word to land with a product that is so filled with consensus that it ends up saying nothing, you know? But we've worked so hard on it that we then want to put it everywhere, you know? When the fact is, what a mission statement really is, it's an internal governance statement. It's that litmus test to make sure we're staying on track. This is not the thing that we use to get other people excited about Main Street. So one of the big things that I want you all to really kind of take and absorb from this is the importance of starting with why we do this. Has anybody read uh, Simon Sinek, uh, the book called It Starts With Why? Okay, great. Then forget Simon Sinek. I created this thing called It Starts <laughs> With no. um, So we're really, really good at talking about the what we do and the how we do, but we rarely get into the why. And you have to remember, it's 2019. I don't know if you all have realized the change, but when you start with facts, you automatically trigger the skeptical mind. Mm -hmm. You say numbers and people are like, I wonder where those came from. I don't believe that number. It's really odd. So how do we actually make a connection so that the data that we have to share can truly be absorbed? So we want to always start with this why. A couple examples here. Our what, we're, we're going after preservation. That is what we're trying to do. How are we doing that? We're doing that through facade grants. Why are we doing it? We're doing it because we believe that our community's uniqueness lies in those buildings. Our buildings tell stories, and without those buildings, we lose part of our uniqueness. That's why we do this. Same thing from the event side. What are we doing? We're creating vibrancy. How are we doing that? Through events and festivals. Why? Because that one person that went to that one event and fell in love with the place and decided to take the risk and work a little harder and go out on a limb and start a business to be part of this community. So starting with
with the why is so very important in this uh, the storytelling and, and understanding that you always lead with emotion. The order matters. This is one of my favorite quotes. No one ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart. <laughs> you know, this idea that you connect with emotion and then you introduce your data. You create that actual rapport so that the story that you have to tell can be received. Um, one of the other things that we've started to do, and again, I'll share this with you all. It might be a kind of fun little, you know, five or ten minute exercise for your board. Um, I created an organizational Mad Lib. You remember Mad Libs when you were a kid where it's like you, every time it was verb, you were like, yes, I get to write fart down. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's like that's the way that it works. If, if you can figure out how to fit fart in here, go for it. But, um, <laughs> What this really does is it adopts this interesting mindset on the elevator speech. I think for the longest time we were convinced that our organizations need to have this singular elevator speech that everybody repeats. But instead, my belief is with a tool like this, what you're doing is you're empowering all of your passionate participants to be able to share with others <coughs> why they choose to participate in that event. Because that personal connection is the thing that might recruit that, that volunteer, might get that person to invest in the organization. So I'll share a PDF of that with you all. And then the final concept with the main five is one of the things we've come to realize is Main Street organizations, doesn't matter what state they're in, doesn't matter how new or old they are, they share the same five audiences. They're communicating to our donors, to our owners, to our public, to our volunteers, and to our government. And if you Take that idea of it starts with why. And you truly think about what is the motivation behind somebody being involved. Why would somebody donate to this? They want to make a change. They want to make their community better. They want to leave a legacy. They want to have their name on something. You know, you might see it as being selfish, but hey, if you've got a million bucks and you want to give it to get your name on a building, we will gladly figure out where to put your name. You know, that motivation for the donor... What's the motivation for owners? I'm putting my heart and soul into this business. I like to always say, I'm putting the event on every day and I'm doing it on my dime. I want somebody there supporting me. We want to know that Main Street is there being a teammate. What's the public's motivation? Hey, we're looking for something fun. We're looking for something cool to do. We want to feel connected to something. What's a volunteer's motivation? Hey, I need to go, go do something that actually makes a difference. Hey, I might be able to in, involve myself with an organization that the moment that I show up, they don't force me to tattoo their logo on my arm because they're so desperate for volunteers. You know, that, that relationship and, and that motivation is very, very important. Government, guess what? This represents the grassroots involvement in economic development. That is something that we rarely, rarely see. City governments offer a lot of ways for the community to be involved, but they're not always the most positive. I mean, you don't meet a whole lot of people that say, let me tell you about the amazing experience I had on the planning and zoning board. That's not the way it works. So being able to realize that Main Street offers to the local government the way that you can convert the community voice into action. And you can also protect a little bit of that. Like, you find a lot of times people don't really like to donate time or money to the same people that tax them. So it creates just enough buffer to receive community support in a way that becomes a political. Does that all make sense for everybody? So with the exact same strategy that we have with that strategic event calendar, we can start to think about as an organization how are we communicating to those five audiences? How are we supporting and connecting with them? Whether we're doing social media year round, whether we're doing targeted campaigns on Instagram, where we're highlighting the business owner and telling their stories in the doldrums, where they feel like everybody hates them because nobody's buying anything, to hitting into early spring when people are starting to get cabin fever and you're saying, hey, you've been stuck in the house. You should get out, get involved. We've got a great way for you to get to connect with the community through event donors. Like, how many times do you 
ask for donations in the middle of the events that you're putting on. Well, never. We're too busy putting them on. What if you adopted a strategy where you had text message donations? If you're having a good time, give us $15 and let us continue to do these great events. I got five kids. When I take them to a street festival and I can occupy them for a little while, you have to realize it cost me $700 to take them to the movie theater. <laughs> you know? like, that's a lot of popcorn. So when you provide something to me, I will gladly support that. So, you know, thinking strategically about how those things fall over the course of the year, looking at it slightly differently and thinking about how much emphasis you have on each of those five audiences, they don't need to be equal. They just need to be well thought out. So this is a great tool for us to use. And then that leads us into the thing that I really love the most is, is this idea of branding and storytelling. Um, why do we brand? Uh, I've got a, a fun illustration here uh, that kind of goes back to the days of when we actually made cakes for our kids. So in the 40s, you'd go to that local grocery, you'd spend about 50 cents on flours and egg and sugar and go home and make the cake. And by the 60s, you'd go and you'd get a, a $2 cake mix. By the 80s, you'd go to the chain grocery store and you'd get those creepy quarter sheet cakes with the little plastic clown heads, which I still don't really understand why they put those on kids' cakes, spend about 10 bucks. And now we're spending $500 and renting Fortnite trailers for our kids' party. And what this illustrates for us is it illustrates that transition from the raw, raw material economy into the product economy, then the service economy, and now we're stuck in the heart and soul of this experience economy. And the experience economy is really fueling this rebirth and reconnection with our downtowns. But what this allows us to do is focus in on our community's personality. And my definition is branding is the discovery and preservation of a community's personality. You don't get branded. Your personality exists. And a branding process is actually a preservation process for your community. It is a way to show your community that the values that you have are something that you're trying to preserve. Um, your goal is to create brand equity. Brand equity is the, the willingness of a person to stay open a little bit longer, or drive a little farther, or spend a little more to connect with your place. And a great example here is, so we've got this Mercedes, right? Leather interior, all Bluetooth, all the, the luxury that you would imagine. How much does this car cost? Take a guess. 50, 75, the, on average, I get people say 60, 65. What happens when you find out that this Mercedes is actually a Kia? Is it still worth $60,000? Absolutely not, you know? When you drive up to a red light in your Mercedes, the people next to you think something about you, and when you drive up in that Kia, they think something different. Neither good nor bad, but different. Being able to capture the value of your community's story and be able to use that value and equity to relate to others is our overall goal. So I figured out that you have to have rules if you're an expert. So we have five rules of branding. The first is called the khaki rule. And this is say no to design by committee. Consensus is not the, the best way for us to break through in the market. So. Um, I, I'd like to say, you know, if we were all here and we had to come up with one and only one outfit that we would all wear for the rest of our lives, we'd end up in khaki pants, you know? Probably end up in khaki pants and a blue polo and we'd end up looking like we work at Best Buy, you know? So the, the thing that you really want to understand is you've got to break through that. You've got to be willing to take a chance. Uh, we worked in Kittitas County, Washington. And Kittitas County is just east of Snoqualmie Pass. It's the first place that the clouds in the gray of Seattle stop. Okay? So we came up with this interesting phrase, live life in color, uh, Kittitas County. You know, from there, we had some of those typical comments. Well, people don't really know where we are, so maybe we need to have a map of the state of Washington. Um, and then, of course, we're a county, so we have to have the name of every community in our county so we don't upset anybody. 
And the committee just kept, kept devolving and devolving <laughs> the idea through trying to reach consensus. And finally, one of the greatest things was we had bought this web domain, WashingtonColor.com. And they were, after a while, they were like, we feel like we need to say Central Washington Colors so people know where we are. It's like, wow, you're really not giving yourself any credit to be able to actually accomplish or communicate at all. So trying to make everything self-explanatory. And at the end of the day, what they landed on was this. They went back to it again. They were finally like, we have made this so horrible that we really just need to listen to the experts. So, you know, <laughs> it, it is an interesting dynamic, but that idea of design by committee, it can be very, very scary. Um, rule two, say no to design contests. Uh, this is a logo that was created for a city in India. Um, they do deserve credit for being thorough. <laughs> they pretty much covered any graphic that would have anything to do. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what a 1960s era Soviet rocket has to do with India, but they got it. You know, they got it all covered. Um, this is actually a logo that came out of a design competition in Germany. They paid 8,000 euros for this. Um, you can imagine that it was not it was not uh, received very well. For some reason, somebody saw this and, and thought it looked like E.T.'s head. And as soon as you see E.T.'s head, your logo is kind of done. Um, but one of the biggest problems is communities is it, they try to be too cute. Um, La Crosse, Kansas, the barbed wire capital of the world. Okay, the, the, There is a big difference in saying what no one else can say and saying what nobody else wants. So, but Kansas can do even worse than this. Uh, gas Kansas, don't pass gas. So their logo is literally a fart joke. So, um, but it gets worse than this. You jump to Oklahoma and you've got Hooker, Oklahoma. It's a location, not a vocation. And I, I wish that I was making this up, but literally their local sports teams are the Holy Coast. Uh, and their senior center self wants to look her all over the t-shirt. So, you know, it, it, can, it can be bad. But honestly, the worst around is Severance, Colorado, where the geese fly and the bulls cry. What does that mean? <laughs> I, I was working in Wyoming, and I came across this, and I was convinced that the bulls cry meant they were the home of a slaughterhouse. I just kind of figured that, you know, there's a lot of ranching going on. Well, the truth was even worse. They're the home of Bruce's Bar, and they're known for their Rocky Mountain oysters, which are bull testicles. So literally, this community wraps its entire identity around bull. So, you know, um, you guys are doing real good in comparison, right? This is a, this is a big ego boost. Um, rule three is the seal rule. A seal is not a marketing tool. This is not what its purpose is. This is an actual seal from the village of Whitefur, New York. Oh, no. They swear that that settler and that native are engaged in a fun game of wrestling. <laughs> um, it was brought up about two and a half years ago that maybe we should change this. Maybe this is culturally insensitive. And the village got together and voted, hell no, we love this. So... That's another kind of side rule. Don't always ask people's opinion, especially the public. You know? It's literally named Whitesboro. It's literally named Whitesboro, which makes it even worse, right? I, I, I truly wish it was a joke, but it's not. Um, but believe it or not, it gets worse than this. Um, Salisbury, Maryland. They figured out a way to get tomatoes, pumpkin, haystack, cucumbers, apples, strawberries, beans, sailboat, pine tree, college building, tree line street, and the building line street all incorporated into the same logo. And the best thing about this is that top right corner of the shield is affectionately known as the Death Star Trench. So you <laughs> earn points for a Star Wars reference anytime you can do this. Um, <clears throat> but we go back to my home state of South Carolina for what I consider to be the worst around. St. Stephen, South Carolina, 
You can literally tell that there were six people that sat around this table because each one got to come up with their own word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's always better with a tractor on it. Um, when you can represent industry by the cutest Christmas tree clip art you've ever seen, you know you're doing something right. And look at how much fun that recreation appears to be. Um, but the thing that really has always struck me about this is St. Stephen is such a patriotic community that they included the head and legs of an American eagle. They could not figure out where to put the wings because, of course, each person got their own star. So, you know, this just really it kind of illustrates that idea of when you try to say everything, you oftentimes say nothing. <laughs> rule four, the screwdriver rule, you must have the right tool for the job. This is something that is very, very prevalent <coughs> in our communities. Um, an example, we always look to colleges and universities. They understand the difference between an academic logo and an athletic logo. And just like that in our communities, we need to understand the difference between destination brands and organization identity. <coughs> Oftentimes, our Main Street organizations, our Chambers of Commerce, our Convention and Visitors Bureaus, they create organizational identities, and then they try to force that into being the destination brand. Um, the city, the city is a government entity. It provides services back to the constituents, but it is not the place. So being able to have a destination brand for the community and then also a subset of that for your downtown is essential in being able to create all the different tools of that toolkit. And then final, um, rule five, a logo is in Google Maps. Um, believe it or not, and this is, this is hitting a little close to home for you guys, um, not, not, just, not just for the city, but I will say, you know, Kirksville deserves credit for being consistent because the city, tourism, and regional economic development all have said, we got it. We're going to nail this logo thing. We're going to put a star on the state outline so everybody knows where we are, right? So here's the thing. We get it. We get where that comes from. You have to understand from an outsider's point of view, that's not conveying the confidence that you deserve. It's kind of acknowledging we know that you have no clue where we are. <laughs> so we're going to try to make this crystal clear for you. So we want to be able to introduce some ideas that maybe add a little bit more confidence into your messaging. Um, so, you know, this is the old one. But I will say, I mean, look at this. You, you went through, you brought it up to date, you freshened it up, and now you got a new one. Um, we believe in this star. So, you know, being able to kind of take that and, and be able to, to learn from that. Um, the way that we approach this is through the, the definition of a branding toolbox where you have defined colors, you have typefaces that you use for continuity, you have kind of a generalized approach to graphics, and then you have the consistency of a message. And I'm doing good on time. So I want to show you a quick example. This is something that I did early in the summer. This is Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Michigan. And this is a collection of all the different logos that they had all at once. Now, everybody got the memo, hey, we need to use blue. But there's no consistency in blue. Um, a lot of freighters getting used, but not the same freighters getting used. So what do we do to bring continuity there? Um, what we were actually focused in on for this community is we were looking at their Main Street organization and their downtown. So they had this interesting idea where they pitched themselves as the original Main Street. They're the first community in Michigan. They were founded in the mid-1600s from the north, from Canada. So got this interesting kind of fur trading history, uh, obviously French origin. Um, introducing this idea of needing this organization brand and this destination brand. They had played around with these and had, in theory, had it right, but graphically, we're still kind of missing the mark a little. Um, one of the other things, as we saw, we saw all these different colors in play from these four major partners in the area, the chamber, the city, the downtown, and the Economic Development Corporation. So when you look at all the different colors, they had like all these different blues. So we brought all these together and we simplified them down 
into a five color palette that you could define the blues and use for color continuity. We picked typefaces, primary and secondary, um, started to show them the evolution of word type. So when you see your name, you see it consistently. When you have a name like Sault Ste. Marie, you have to show them that, hey, it's not always gonna fit on one line. Kirksville's the same way. I mean, granted, you're not multiple words, but you've got a long name. So you're gonna have to figure out how you can have different variations of that format. Um, and then simply introducing a very simple approach to graphics here. These three simple icons help them to tell the story of their history. Um, the, they've got locks, they're right on the international border. There's actually a Sault Ste. Marie, Canada, right across the river from them. So there's a lot of interesting things going on there, border town, patriotism, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're the home of the university and their mascot's the Laker. So, you know, a lot of different things going on. We then took those three icons and three colors and had them represent the three different street-based districts of their downtown because their downtown's kind of a T. So they had one side, which was Portage Ave, one side that was Water Street, and then Ashman Street running into it. Um, with the organization with Main Street, we created a slight variation of that. We still used our four colors, uh, pointing to the four-point approach. Something we did there was in Michigan, they're funded by a DDA. They have a TIF that then funds the DDA, and the DDA is kind of this underlying mechanism that powers Main Street. Who cares? You know, like... DDA is not sexy. That's not what I want to go and, and volunteer for. So we adopted this very, very simple graphic that simply says funded by DDA. So anytime they're doing events or they're doing projects that they want to attribute where the funds came from, they can incorporate that simple graphic. And then they don't feel compelled to incorporate DDA into any of their other language. So it kind of handled that for them. Uh, so now all of a sudden they're starting to see this evolution come together, how the city could adopt some of this through adopting typeface without changing their logo. Um, EDC, again, taking the same concept they had, evolving that a little bit, adopting the typeface and the colors. Merchandise, they call it the Sioux. Um, so going in and doing that kind of stuff, they love their freighters and their locks. So fun play on words there with uplifting. Um, then where it really starts to get fun is where the brand elements and toolkit make their way into the events. They did a thing called Ladies Night Out. So using some of the typeface, but still having the freedom to really make it feel the way that it should. Again, typefaces and colors, connecting the dots. Rock the Locks 5K. So you can see there's consistency, but there's enough latitude to wrap your arms around the different kind of personalities. Sidewalk sale was one of their major retail promotions, happened twice a year. It's a long time tradition, especially for very seasonal locations where they needed to move the seasonal inventory to make room for the next season. So they'd always do their, sometimes they're called crazy days. Um, they still are doing cash mobs. I'm not a big fan of cash mobs. They were cool for like three and a half minutes. And then, you know, some places they work, other places they just, it's kind of like they, they had a, a cash mob at an um, um, irrigation store. I'm like, oh, that doesn't really seem to make sense to me. So, um, you know, but if it works for you, it works for you. They do a restaurant week. Um, so you start to see this continuity between those events. Uh, but then also making its way out into things like signage, having that consistency through the wayfinding signage, being able to adopt a banner system where, again, each one of those streets got this color. They had a really, really robust uh, veteran banner program. Now, I can tell you this. I was not going to be the guy coming in and saying, I like your banner or your veteran banners, but you need to take those down. Yeah, that's suicide. So being able to figure out how you can simply add this simple color-shaped banner, go to a two-banner system, making these veteran banners the space for interchangeable. And I think that this actually kind of hits a little bit on some of the complaints we heard here about, hey, you know, we've got a ton of banners, but it means that a lot of banners aren't up that long, and how do we create a, a better approach to that? So we're going to hit some more on that specifically for you guys. Um, seeing the way that, like, from an economic vitality committee, how they might incorporate the branding into a business recruitment guide, being able to focus in on welcome back events for the students, 
especially those freshmen, 25% of your uh, student population is turning over every year. So you have to make new retail connections with them. So making sure you take advantage of that window when they're creating those retail ties and then incorporating it into the marketing and messaging with ad templates and showing how you can tell the story of what you have in the community and then have a template that your business can lean on to be able to tell their story as well. So that was my stuff. I nailed it. You have five minutes to go. You go long. I go short. We still feel it early. Um, so do you guys have any 